a study on the book of Romans. If you, if this is your first time tuning in with us, my name is Jordan Van Evel, and I am thrilled to journey through this impactful letter with all of you. Just as a reminder, Romans is an amazing letter addressing key aspects of our faith, salvation, righteousness, and many other things. So we're going to be talking through all of that. Our goal is to unpack its teachings and discover how those teachings apply to our lives today. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 15 is where we're going to find ourselves today. And I'm excited for you guys that you're coming back. I hope that the introduction and background information was helpful to you all. Um, I know that that was a a labor of love for sure. Uh, Romans is a very interesting letter, a very deep letter, and it's one that I think we gain a lot of insight into um, and so I hope that, that that was helpful. I hope that that informed you of who Paul was, what the context is, when he's writing, all of that stuff. And you should watch that video before you continue. And so if this is the first time you've tuned into Romans, awesome. We're happy to have you. Um, go back and watch that first video, the introduction and background. That will give you plenty of context, plenty of things to, to study about Paul and his life. So as we get started today in, in week chapter two, um, in week two, sorry, Romans chapter one, we're going to be talking about verses one through 15. We're going to answer a couple of uh, important questions. We're also going to look at a few context um, topics and things like that, that that are going to be important for us. This week, we're going to take a look at the introduction and greeting that Paul makes to the Roman church. So we're going to get all the way up through verse 15. This letter is going to follow the normal first century writing style. It's going to start with the author's name. Um, Recognize that that is different than the way that we do it today. We would normally today say, dear Romans, and then end with our name. Um, And instead, here in the ancient world, they would have gone the opposite direction. Uh, They would have said their own name first and then left the greetings uh, for the second half of that entry paragraph, as we see uh, to all those in Rome who are called by God and called to be saints, um, loved by God and called to be saints. But we also get to see Uh, at the end, he's going to specifically address several people and greet those people in chapter 16. And so this is a little backwards from what we're used to seeing uh, in our normal everyday letter writing. If you write letters regularly, you're going to notice that this is quite a bit different. But most of the epistles are all the same. Uh, Most of Paul's epistles, almost all of Paul's epistles are written in this same style. And so that's going to be really important for you guys to recognize as you go through this this very first thing, because this is a very normal start to a letter. Um, Notice also that Paul has a writing style, and yet the Holy Spirit perfectly superintends what Paul writes. Now, those two things seem to go against each other, right? And this is leading us into a short discussion on how the Holy Spirit writes the Word of God using human authors, And so we want to affirm with the the church throughout the millennia that the Holy Spirit has perfectly and authoritatively written the word of God, but he's done so using human authors and not just as robots, not as puppets, not just to write down whatever it is that he dictates to them, but instead that he perfectly uses their personalities, their writing styles, all of these things to write exactly what God intends. And so we want to we want to affirm that in this course as we get started. Scripture is written by human authors exactly as God intends. And so we want to we want to affirm that as we get started today. And you're going to see more and more. We'll point out a few points where Paul talks about something in his own way. And this is why we think about context. This is why we need to understand why we need to know that about Paul who he was, all of this stuff, because it helps us to understand the letter just as God intended. And so in verse one, we're actually going to go through, and I hope that you have your Bibles present because this lecture will actually not have the verses alongside it, because I'm assuming that you all are reading through the book of Romans. And so if you have your paper Bible, I hope that you would open with us to Romans chapter one. We're going to be in one through 
15. And if you don't have a Bible present, you can open up another window um, just in this one. If you're watching this video, you can open up a window to BibleGateway.com. And I'm going to be referencing to the English Standard Version. Um, most of your versions are not going to be all that different. Um, if you use the NIV, the NLT, the English Standard, the uh, New American Standard, if you're really um, academic, uh, you can use the New King James, the King James, all of this will be very similar. And actually in this first verse, it becomes a little bit interesting uh, for us because in this first verse in Romans chapter one, verse one, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, why the difference? Why does it say a servant of Christ Jesus? And many of you are going to have in that word, a little, a little, I have a number one in my Bible. You may have a little mark just denoting that something is going on here. What is that word in the background and why is that word important? Well, Paul makes it clear that he's much more connected to Jesus than a simple servant might be. Um, it's probably best said either bond servant or slave. Um, I would pr usually prefer the term slave except for in an American context, we have a, a very different understanding of slavery uh, than would have been present in the ancient world. And so I do want to recognize that. That's why the ESV chooses servant. Your Bible may render that as slave. It's all the same underlying Greek word. The Greek word there is doulos. And we want to recognize that for one major reason is because there is a servant or slave and master relationship being noted here in Romans chapter one. Jesus is the Lord of Paul. And we want to recognize that there is a, a word play going on here with Paul, where he is making it very clear that Jesus is the kurios. That's the, the Greek word for this, which means Lord or master, and specifically Lord or master over someone else. And so Lord of, or master over the servant, bond servant, or slave who is Paul. We're going to see this throughout. Um, as I said the other uh, during the introduction, this is going to become important. This imagery of, of someone who has, who has been taken over, who has been moved from one thing to another, um, is going to become very important because of how Paul was converted um, on the Damascus road by a direct encounter with Christ. We also have the word apostle used here. And this is an important thing. You may hear modern people call themselves apostle, and those people would be wrong. Um, and there's a reason for that, because the apostle is defined as someone who speaks with the authority of Jesus because of a direct and immediate call by Jesus. And we see Paul's direct and immediate call by Jesus in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. This is a gift which was finished in the New Testament after the writing of the books which we have um, and we recognize as the New Testament. There's a lot more that we can go into and explain that. That's not the main point of this passage, uh, but I'd be happy to explain that, talk through that with you um, as to why we don't have apostles um, anymore in that same um, authoritative um, sense as we did in the first century. So please ask me um, and go look up Acts chapter 9 verse 15. The nice thing about this video is you can go and pause this whenever you want to. Um, Paul is set apart for the gospel of God, uh, not his own gospel, and recognize the language there. Um, Paul is set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel is not his own gospel, but it's the gospel of which God is the cause and the originator. He is the person who has made this happen, and he's also the person that is the good news. Um, and so recognize that Paul is not saying, this is something I made up. This is directly from God. Now, as we move into Romans chapter 1, verse 2, and it will pick up a little bit faster now, we get this really important idea that all of this, all of this gospel stuff was promised beforehand uh, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, talking about God. And I gave you on this slide just a few quick examples of that. Back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, uh, we see what's called the Proto-Evangelium, which basically just means the first gospel, the first good news telling. And we call it that because it's during the curse on, on Eve. And God says, one of your descendants 
Um, notice there that he says one of your descendants, not one of their descendants. And so recognizing that we're already seeing the virgin birth pop through a little bit, um, we're going to notice in that very first section of the fall that God is already planning a redemptive act in the world. Um, the Her offspring will crush the head of the serpent. And so recognize that that is going to happen. And we're seeing it all the way back in Genesis. Then we skip forward, and these are not exhaustive at all. There's between two and 400 of these throughout the Old Testament. But if we recognize in Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12, Christ is recognized as the sacrifice for sins. He's despised and rejected by men. You can always go and pause this, read these for yourselves, because I'd love for you to spend some time in each of these. And then in Zechariah, and I think this is one of the clearest uh, points forward to Jesus in the Old Testament, uh, we see that the fountain of, of forgiveness is opened for God's people. And this points forward to Christ uh, in his body and his blood broken and shed for us. And so we're already seeing throughout the Old Testament, like I said, there's between two and 400 of these prophecies, um, depending on how you reckon all of these. And so I'd encourage you, go and, and look some of these up. There are great resources for uh, good prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. So go and find those. I just wanted to point that out as we're getting started in Romans. Romans chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 um, talk about the Son and who he is. And I am going to read these verses to help us out a little bit. It says, concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So there's a few things that are really important about the gospel here. He's making very clear who this person is, who is Christ Jesus, and who is he that was promised by the prophets for the gospel. And so we see from the beginning that Jesus, the son of, Ma of God from all eternity, John chapter one, verse one, you can look up some of these references if you'd like. And then that, that son of God came down and took on flesh. We see that in verse 3, but we also see that in, the, in Luke and Matthew's account as they reckon with his genealogical record. All of, you know who his mom was, his dad was. All of these, these wonderful facts about Jesus are known to us. Um, and then he, he defeats death on the cross, proving who he was. And he is raised to life again proving that he is who he said he was, which was the Son of God, verse, chapter, verse 4 in Romans 1. And then not only is he our Savior, but he is also our Lord. He is that kurios figure that I told you about earlier, kurios and doulos, that master and servant-slave bond-servant relationship. And so Paul is very clear on who our gospel is founded upon. He is founded upon Jesus Christ. And so if we do not have a Savior who is risen, we do not have a Savior. If we do not have a Savior who has died, we do not have a Savior. We believe that Jesus Christ is the reason for the hope that we have in God. Verse 5 talks a little bit more about apostleship. And um, again, I want to continue to clarify this. Um, I know there are some churches that hold that there are apostles today, and I would disagree with that, um, given the fact that, that those people are not authoritative, they're not always correct. They make false prophecies. Um, and so I want to recognize that, that apostleship is a first century gift given to the church to make sure that they are well guided. Um, Jesus Christ gave to the apostles as a whole the ministry of being apostles, but also gives to all of us the grace and obedience of faith that marks us as Christians. Paul is making it clear that he did not one day choose to follow Christ, but was instead taken from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And again, you should see Acts chapter 9 for his actual conversion story, but I do want to recognize that he they received grace and apostleship so that these this faith, this obedience would take place in the world today. 
And so I want you guys to see that. And continuing on in verse six, Paul likely means this in two senses. He says, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Not only are, are we are the ones that are called, though that is shown throughout this letter and it's that calling idea is gonna become very important as we go through Romans. We're also instruments that God uses to call others to himself. And so Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, the great commission, therefore go and make disciples. And he goes on, um, talking about that. And that becomes a very important piece of this, this introduction. Remember, this is all Paul just introing to this letter. He's going to give us a couple of hints where he's going. We're already seeing some of those hints of calling and the gospel, the righteousness that is going to be given to us. Verse 7 asks a couple of important questions to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a great application section. Um, At first glance, it doesn't look that important, but I want to point your attention to who are loved by God and called to be saints. And there's a question here. Are you saved? Is there doubt about your salvation? And the question that Paul asks, and he continues to ask this throughout the book of Romans, is who does the saving? Because if it is by God then you don't have anything to worry about. If it, is by, if it is God by his love and his calling in your life, you ought not to be worried about that salvation. Now, you should continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling as we're told in other places, but we want to recognize that, that you are saved in Christ. And so if you are saved in Christ, then you are saved. Um, additionally, I thought this was interesting. Paul echoes a Roman, uh, a Hebrew understanding of a greeting here. And here he says this, this phrase, Shalom Alechem, which is this greeting, which Paul is, is echoing here. And it just means peace be unto you. And the reverse, Alechem Shalom would say the same thing. And to you, peace be. He's just kind of reversing this. And this is similar to in the church today when we say Christ is risen. Oh, he is risen indeed. You may hear that occasionally in the church. He wants us to know that as those who have received God's grace, we have peace with him and are no longer his enemies. And he's going to make a big point about this in Romans chapter 5. And just as you can see, the Holy Spirit is, is perfectly making this work out so that the entire letter connects in such amazing ways. So we'll get back into that topic of peace with God in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 1 verse 8, we get to see this thankfulness which he has for these people. He says in in verse 8, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. He uses this word, eucharisto, which is actually said today in Greek as efkaristo. They've changed some of that, um, some of that uh, pronunciation has changed a bit, but it's still the Greek word for thanks today. You go over to Greece today, you can see that this word actually means the same thing it did 2,000 years ago, and it's because it's a really, really good word. I want you to notice, too, the similarity with the word Eucharist, which is another word for communion. Paul works these references to the gospel in all the time. He talks about how the the body of Christ is broken, his blood is shed for us, and we receive that every week as a reminder for what he has done in our lives. And so Paul works these references into the gospel all the time throughout the book of Romans. You're going to continue to see this in his giving thanks narratives uh, to the various people which he talks to. And the church in Rome is known throughout the known world for their faith. And I actually have a, a slide for you guys to be able to see this a little bit clearer. Hopefully, this is kind of helping you all to see. I know the image is not perfectly centered. I was having a hard time with the technology side. And if you look at this, and I want to point your attention down to the right side of the map, where you're going to see a couple of strange words. Um, you'll recognize Syria and Assyria and Mesopotamia. You may recognize Iodea as Judea. And this is because this is a, uh, a Roman um, Latin map of the area. And all of the, the places that are, are, um, are dark on this map are places where the Roman Empire was present in 
um, in and around the time of Christ. Now, this is actually the map of from 117, which is about the, the largest they got. Um, that would include some of the, con- the conquests in Britannia, all the way up in the left side, um, and maybe down through some of Arabia um, as well, just some extra con- conquests. But this was kind of the known world at the time. This was largely what they thought of as every part of the world. And so they're saying that, that Christians are, from Rome, Roma in the middle of the map on slightly to the left, are known in all of these regions as Christians. And I think that's really important for us to recognize what a a neat thing that is. All the way from Armenia to Mauritania, all the way from Britannia to Arabia, these Christians are recognized as being Christ followers. And this is a really important thing. I hope that our faith would have the same type of impact. This is thousands of miles worth of territory that these Christians would be known for their Christianity. Romans chapter 1 verses 9 through 10 says this, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Paul swears a vow here. And I want us to recognize that that is a weird thing to do um, in the context of some of the Bible's commands not to. Um, Jesus commands ten, seems to command uh, generally not to make vows. Um, however, the vow given here by Paul is like that of a reassurance or even of a marriage, of a covenant, one given to assure and not to use as manipulation. And so we want to recognize Paul is using a an acceptable thing. I still think we should be careful with swears and promises um, because our yes should be yes and our no should be no. But we want to recognize that that Paul is um, using a an assurance to say we I deeply desire to visit you and I I want to come and come to this Roman church so that I would be able to spend some time so that I'd be able to focus on this with you. Verses eleven and twelve continues and it says, "For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift that to strengthen you, that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours." and mine. So what is Paul's spiritual gift? I'm sure many of you have taken a spiritual gifts test before. Maybe you know what you have, what your spiritual gift is, what your talents are. Maybe you're an administrative genius, or maybe you are somebody who can teach or preach or or speak eloquently. Maybe you're somebody who is so hospitable and kind to other people. These are all spiritual gifts. And Paul's spiritual gift is that he is an apostle. And this is a very unique spiritual gift, specifically even to Paul, that he is the apostle to the Gentiles. Therefore, he has the unique position of being someone who is called by Jesus to speak his words to his people. And Paul is also aware of the variety of gifts which the Holy Spirit creates in the members of the church. He might be hinting at the Holy Spirit's activity, though this is a guess. We can find some of Paul's understanding of the Holy Spirit in the church in chapter 12, verses 5 through 8 of Romans. And you can also see the fuller spiritual gifts um, the spiritual gifts list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, largely in 4 through 31. You can see all of those. And that will help to see because I think Paul here is talking mostly about how to encourage and build one another up. And the church does that through the use of the Holy Spirit in the spiritual gifts which are provided to us as Christians. And so we want to recognize what is happening there. Romans chapter 1 verse 13 says this, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often come to you, often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Paul is writing primarily to a Gentile audience in this letter. We know this because the Jewish people had been exiled from Rome by Emperor Claudius just a short time, relatively speaking, before this letter was written. This likely happened sometime between AD 41, that's quite an early date, and 53, probably a little more likely towards the end of that time. And then Romans is written between 55 and 58. And so this is only a fairly short time that they're, um, that the Jews had been exiled from Rome. It's a much longer story why that happens, um, 
the there have, has been anti-Semitism present in the world for a long time, and it and it's present there as well. You can look into that story, but I did want to point that out because Paul is speaking to a largely Gentile audience, but they do understand Judaism enough because that's how it got back there. If you remember, um, it's Jewish people who come and see Pentecost and are converted to Christianity, um, that they recognize that and they go back to, uh, they go back to Rome and spread the gospel. And so they have a Jewish understanding, even though now they're, they're Gentiles. And we're going to hit that as we continue to go through the book of Romans. Verses 14 and 15, Paul is obligated not to man, but to God in his calling. Verse 14 says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Recognize how kind of crazy that is. He's saying he's under obligation. He's not under obligation to the people. Um, He has an obligation to them because God has given it to him. He's under obligation to God in this calling. Paul is rescued out of his own sin and set up as the apostle to the Gentiles, a work which he has taken incredibly seriously. Um, Paul has already traveled extensively, and we're going to see a map on the next slide, and he's been promoting the gospel all over the, the eastern half of the known world, and so he intends to go to the west. We're going to see on this map, I know the, the quality is not the greatest in the world, but if you notice, this is a much more detailed map, and all of these lines indicate journeys and, and missionary things that Paul has gone on simply to spread the gospel. Now, notice how he has largely covered the entirety of the Mediterranean coast east of Corinth, east of Berea, Thessalonica, up kind of in the middle. And he hasn't really gone down through Egypt. There are some other things that happen uh, on account of that. But he feels called to go up and west, out to Rome, and then eventually, possibly, and we'll talk about that later on in the series, to Spain. He may eventually make it out to Spain, depending on your timeline of when he is killed, when he is murdered for the faith. And so he feels a calling to, to go outside of the traveled areas which he has already been in and go out west into Italy and begin to preach the gospel to those in Spain, which is just off the map on the far left side. So I wanted you guys to, have to, be able to, to be able to see that and be able to see what journeys Paul has undertaken already. He is under serious obligation for the gospel. And Paul feels called to go to Rome and possibly on to Spain, as I already said, in search of people to preach the gospel to that had never heard it before. In this sense, Paul is a great evangelist sent to the furthest reaches of the known world to preach the gospel. And so what is that gospel? And that's the question that we're going to be answering largely throughout the book of Romans. And so we're going to see the righteousness of God imputed, we'll use that word next week, to us. And so join us next week as we talk through Romans chapter 1, verse 16.